You mentioned before that insulin levels could be elevated. This gets me thinking about kind of predicting your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And, and I've seen mixed views on this about how accurate measure, you know, insulin um, lab sort of uh, assays are. But you know, before we get to the, the assay itself, what you're speaking to here is that in that early stage where you have this increased fat in the, the liver, and with that you get um, increase in, in blood glucose and the pancreas responds by producing more insulin. So at, at a certain stage of this kind of journey from metabolically healthy to type 2 diabetes, you might have normal blood glucose levels but have elevated insulin because the pancreas is kind of trying to compensate and producing a lot of insulin, but you are able to keep blood glucose in, in a kind of quote unquote healthy range. Is, is that a kind of early predictor, an early kind of alarm bell, so to speak, that you're on your way to type two diabetes, that you, your pancreas and those beta cells are kind of fighting for their life and you're just hanging in there at that moment? Unfortunately, the range of normal levels of insulin is such that it's very difficult to do a single test and say, ah, that's raised. So the usual quoted normal range for plasma insulin first thing in the morning is 2 to 11 uh, millimole per litre, uh, uh, millions per litre. But that gives it all away. If a person who usually runs at 2 millimole per litre, uh, 2 milliunits per litre, uh, has risen considerably up to, say, 5 or 7, they don't stand out at all. It's only those people in the upper range who would move themselves outside the so-called normal range. So it's, it's not precise, unfortunately, and precision is a matter of being certain that the outcome of a test uh, indicates what you think it might indicate. So the precision for a fasting insulin is quite low, and there are one or two other factors. Transporting insulin to the lab is a problem. If it's left in contact with the, uh, the blood cells, especially the white blood cells, then the levels will go down steadily because the enzymes in the white blood cells will tend to be breaking it down. And so it needs to be separated early. It needs to be chilled. It's a difficult measure to make. There, there is one other substance that is measured alongside insulin often, and that is thrown out at the same time as every molecule of insulin, this bit of, if you like, garbage that helps in the manufacture is thrown out, and that's called C-peptide. And it's actually quite a useful measure of insulin secretion. Now, in blood samples, it is relatively unstable, and again, you need to handle the sample carefully. But in fact, in urine samples, it is quite stable. And although it hasn't entered any sort of routine uh, use at the present time, the overnight um, C-peptide level in urine is a reasonable guide to the amount of insulin that's actually being produced. And that could well be a simple test of the future. But, you know, I'm speculating here and looking forward uh, to indicate what might be possible. And that really underscores the fact that, no, don't rely on blood tests at the present time other than, other than glucose, to de glucose and triglyceride to detect the earliest risk of type 2 diabetes. You mentioned there that Another clue is just looking back at the past decade or so and seeing if you your weight has crept up. I've seen in the literature this kind of uh, recommendation to keep your waist circumference to half of your height. And I saw a few studies mentioning that that was a decent predictor of metabolic syndrome. Is that something that you've come across? Yes, indeed. And it would be a far better measure than the body mass index. Not perfect, but better. And indeed, it's one thing that I have in mind to do where I have 
uh, some uh, uh, spare time to go back over the data from our studies and look at the weight-height ratio and see how it just pans out, how it is as a risk factor, how it is. Um, obviously, it's a good um, it's a good measure of the weight loss naturally because you've got weight over height. Um, but as a risk factor, yes, it is actually uh, a step forward. And if only we could move away from relying upon BMI and imagining these fixed thresholds. You're obese if your BMI is over 30. Well, I, no, uh, it doesn't work like that because of different body types. And so uh, these amazing individuals who are playing in the Rugby World Cup at the present time, they're not obese, but many of them have BMIs over 30. They're just uh, heavily built guys with, of course, the additional training. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. If we're thinking a little bit more here about preventing type 2 diabetes and someone kind of wanting to know what their metabolic health status above and beyond triglycerides looking at your fasting glucose your hba1c making sure that all those things are in the normal range waist circumference to height ratio which we just spoke about is there any extra predictive power or rationale for dexa scans for example that often have a visceral fat kind of measurement or liver ultrasound or using continuous glucose monitors what do you what do you think about these sorts of things for the general public or someone who's listening and just wants to understand you know, a, a picture or get a, a kind of look into their current metabolic health i think I would advise such a person that the, the way to a, a happier life is to stop worrying about it, but to ensure that the weight is approximately what it was in early adult life, or if they were actually too heavy then, to bring it down a bit. Now, one measure we haven't talked about so far is the percentage body fat. That is something which again, has a moderately wide range. Men, you'd find having a total percentage of the, uh, the body as fat would be between about 9 and about uh, 20%. In women, it's higher, of course. That's just how uh, biology is set up. And it goes from the low 20s up to, say, 32. So if you're above that normal range, well, you know, we really ought to be considering shedding some weight because that's a, that's a measure, a direct measure of the uh, fat. And this is something which is easily done with these uh, fat monitors that you can find in gyms or uh, even in chemist shops. So, yes, percentage body fat is an indicator, but really just adopting this ethos. We need to maintain our early, early adult weight. Weight gain in adult life is 100% fat. So that really would be my main message. And embarking upon tests that have a low precision has got a huge problem, and that is inducing worry. So I wouldn't advise people to seek out tests uh, unless there's a high prior probability of issues. For instance, if people in your family have type 2 diabetes, that changes the relative benefit and the precision of all these tests and pushes it up. It's a, it's a funny phenomenon that we call prior predictability. And so, yes, if there's reason to believe that you may be at risk of type 2 diabetes, then embarking upon tests, especially a simple fasting glucose test, is a very reasonable action. Otherwise, you open the floodgates of worry, leading to need for more tests, more investigations, and 
uh, not necessarily improving your total happiness in life. Right. No, I think that's very sound advice. And even if you have that family history, uh, I guess it's still important to be using tests or getting tests that have been shown to be useful and predictive and um, so that you can actually make meaningful decisions with the data that you get um, versus some you know, versus some of the things that you might come across online that seem very cutting edge, but haven't necessarily been put under the scientific method. And um, with that, it may be that we don't know what to do with that data. And that's where that anxiety and stress can, can creep in because you've got a result that, you know, we really don't know what it means. That's absolutely correct. And I, You've taken the words out of my mouth because we're just going on to say that there are various offers online of doing marvellous tests and divining things that are just wonderful and tell you about your your personal metabolic state and your personalised nutrition. And basically, they're not reliable. They're just completely money-making uh, scams, unfortunately. Often, they're mixed in with good points. And so, yes, many of them would advocate weight loss. Not all of them point to sensible ways of losing weight. But there is a problem. If an offer is dressed up in scientific terms, saying we do continuous monitoring and uh, find out what sort of person you are, and then we advise you what to do, well, that's hooey. Um, and basically... Uh, Throughout throughout human history, there have always been charlatans, and the present age is no exception. It's just that the effect has been magnified um, by the availability of information over the web. Mm-hmm.